Hello, I believe that we are live. So this is my my second ever YouTube broadcast. So hello, welcome everybody. Uh, this here is Sienna. Behind me, I've got uh, I've got Ruby who's asleep. She might start snoring during the presentation. These two dogs like to snore a lot, so that's always fun. Um, I've got my live chat open here, so I can actually watch you guys on my phone. Uh, so hopefully I'll be able to interact a little bit more with you today than uh, last time. Last time was my first experiment. So today we're going to talk about the evolution of new functions. And so that's pretty exciting. I'm going to start sharing my screen here and I've got some slides that I've prepared for you. Uh, um, screen share. Oh, where are you going? Okay. The endless tunnel of my screen. Okay. Uh, that. So, um, we're going to talk about the Fitzroy River turtle and its amazing ability to breathe through its butt. And we're going to talk about how that evolved, and we're going to talk about how new functions evolve in general, and you know, new new organs, new structures. We're going to learn how it is that those things evolve, and I'm going to be doing a question and answer section. Uh, I'm actually going to do two of them throughout this presentation. So if you've got some questions, uh, save those for the question and answer time. Otherwise, you know, feel free to chat about whatever in the comment section. So long as you are, uh, you know, being nice to each other, <laughs> keeping things PG. So today, oh, here on my slides, I'm going to do a Q&A halfway through and then again at the end. Super chats are priority. I don't know if you know much about super chats, but that allows you to like, uh, you know, throw a little bit of money my way. And it makes it so that I can see your comment at the very top of all the comments. So if you have a question that you really want to be answered, um, super chats are priority, but I'll, I'll answer pretty much any question that I can find in the um, during the Q&A. Um, yeah, be nice to people in the comments. And I'm going to try to keep this presentation PG. Uh, you know, it's kind of, I'm, I'm new to this. And <laughs> yeah, that's my goal. Evolution, of course, is, um, well, it's, evolution is about survival and reproduction. So sometimes things do get a little bit adult <laughs> in these conversations. So, but yeah, I'll try and keep it PG. Let's see. Okay, so today's question comes from Peter. And Peter, actually, he wrote me a uh, a very excited email <laughs> uh, a little on September 5th asking a whole bunch of questions and one of which was how does function come about from non-function and just so you know just kind of like a basic uh, tip for anybody who's trying to get someone to respond to them by email that they don't actually know personally I recommend keeping things short and very succinct in emails if you're emailing someone that you don't really know that well. Actually, I recommend doing that anytime you write an email. We've kind of got to this point in our culture where we don't we don't really think about emails. We just send them because it's cheap and easy to send one, right? But we really should be <laughs> more careful and considerate in our correspondence with other people. If I were trying to ask a question from a researcher that I didn't know, I would I would, first of all, read everything the researcher has, has done. I'd go to their website. I'd figure out all the stuff that they, um, that they do, the things that they teach. And I'd only ask a question that is not already directly addressed by their work. So most of the questions that he wrote here are already directly addressed by videos that I have on the Stated Clearly channel, which he hasn't watched yet. So in the future, um, advice to anyone asking questions of anyone else <laughs> Um, in the scientific community or, you know, on YouTube, actually read their stuff first, watch their stuff first, and then ask questions afterwards. So this is, this is one of the questions he, he had in here that was very legitimate. 
How does function come about from non-function? That's something I don't really address in my videos, so I'm going to address that today. I guess I sort of do, but uh, so yeah, I'm going to respond to that question here. So how does new function evolve? Well, there's kind of three ways that we've we've seen new functions evolve. And first of all is gradually, each step along the way being beneficial to the organism's survival and reproduction. And we also have what we call hopeful monsters. This is a, a term coined by uh, Stephen Jay Gould to talk about these kind of big mutations that happen that, that really change an animal's function and form. And usually the first individual that, that undergoes a, a big mutation is kind of uh, messed up, but they might have a big enough of an, an advantage that they can survive and reproduce, and maybe even sometimes be better at surviving and reproducing than their neighbors um, because that hopeful mutation was, was so good. But oftentimes it comes with a bunch of weird little disabilities that have to get worked out over time, over evolutionary time. And then third is exaptation, and I'll talk about that um, in a second. But I want to show you with dogs the examples of a gradual step-by-step -step, um, change in form and then the kind of hopeful monster type change in form. And let me uh, go back to my uh, camera here. <laughs> my, my dog's starting to snore. Um, let me go stop sharing my screen. Hey, wake up. <laughs> Woo. So, sorry. <laughs> so this here is an example of a hopeful monster. The mutation that um, flattened the, this is a, these, these dog breeds that have flat faces, the mutation that flattened their faces is something that uh, really happened for the most part all at once. Uh, it's a fairly simple mutation that causes the skull to do this. But as a result, they have a very flat face and they have some disabilities because of this. Like you just heard her snoring. That's a result of that mutation. Are you going to go back to sleep? <laughs> so I've got, here I've got a wolf skull. Um, it's kind of blown out. The, the lighting's a little bit too bright in here for my webcam here, but this is a wolf skull. And then this is a skull actually of a, uh, a French, uh, French bulldog. And you can see that huge difference. The huge difference happened pretty much all at once. And as a result of that, the teeth are kind of messed up. Um, but the big benefit of this mutation is that humans think it's cute. <laughs> and because dogs currently live in an environment full of humans that want to take care of them. Um, being cute is a huge survival advantage if you are a dog. So even though this mutation causes some breathing problems and causes some, some teeth problems, the fact that these little flat, whoa, whoa. she doesn't want to be on camera anymore, apparently. <laughs> I, I'm disturbing her sleep. The fact that these uh, flat faces are um, are so cute to humans makes it a huge advantage for them. So back to my slides here. So another, another good example of uh, a gradual, uh, something that would work gradually, so where every step along the way is a benefit. We've got, if you look at a chicken's feet, you can see that they've kind of got a little bit of webbing between their toes. And you look at a duck and they've got a lot of webbing. And this actually could have happened in a hopeful monster type scenario where you had a mutation that caused a lot of webbing between the toes but it also could have happened in a gradual step-by-step -step manner where you have a little bit of webbing developing and then more and more and more until you have something like a, uh, a duck's foot. And this would be selected for in an environment where there's a lot of water and um, you've got the, uh, the, selected, the selective advantage of having webbed feet. 
And this could happen gradually, every step along the way being slightly beneficial, or again, could have happened all at once. This is another example of a completely different form of webbed feet. This is in a bird called the American coot, which is also an aquatic bird. And it, instead of having webbing between the toes, actually just flattened out its toes. There's these scales that hang off the, the toes there, which is really cool. So those are the three types of of ways that new functions evolve. And the third is exaptation. That's where an old trait is used for a new function. So when a trait or organ starts being used for a second function, one for which it did not originally evolve, that's what we call an exaptation. This word, by the way, was also coined by Stephen Jay Gould. He, he did a lot of, uh, um, you know, conceptual work in evolutionary biology. This here is a leaf and you can see the veins of the leaf there. This here is a different type of leaf. This is from a bull thistle. And you can see that the spikes, I mean, this is the kind of weed that you get in your yard and it's a huge pain in the butt to take care of because it's got these giant spikes on it. And you can see that it's weapons. It's these spikes actually evolved from just veins in the leaf, veins which were already being used to carry nutrients to and from the, the, the leaves nutrients and sugar, um, you know, the, the leaves are producing sugar and that sugar is going back out to the plant through these, through these veins. And in this plant, just by extending past the margin of the leaf and drying out, those veins developed a, a brand new function, one which did not exist before. And that is th this ability to be a, uh, a weapon. So, and it's quite a formidable weapon too. There's actually, I believe in this plant, there's also toxins that have evolved in the, you could say the, the blood of the plant. Because when you, get, when you get pricked by one of these, it actually hurts for quite a while. It's like kind of like getting stung. Not as bad as getting stung by a bee, but it's, it's, it does irritate you. Uh, this here, oh, I was hoping it would play. Looks like it doesn't want to play on uh, on um, on my slides here, but this bird is kind of going through an acceptation here. This is a um, you can find this on YouTube. There's this bird that will use its fallen feathers as back scratchers. Uh, what he's doing right there is he's kind of chewing on the end of it, and then he'll he'll put it behind his feathers and scratch his little head with it. So there's organisms are constantly developing new new functions, new, uh, new acceptations uh, as time goes on. So this here is kind of a list of different traits that evolved through acceptation. You know, it's a lot of times when we find a trait that evolved as an acceptation, it's really hard for us to figure out how it evolved because they're really complex structures. And the reason for that is that they had, you know, when we looked at the, the webbed feet in ducks, it's pretty easy to see how that could have evolved in a kind of a straight path. But when exaptations occur, evolution occurs in this weird zigzaggy path. And it, it can be really difficult to actually pinpoint how a particular structure evolved. So um, the bacterial flagellum, has been used by creationists for, for a while now to say that, oh, something like this could not have evolved. Uh, and the reason they say that is they say that it's irreducibly complex and that it could not have evolved in a straight line where each slight variation is beneficial for the organism. And that is true. The bacterial flagellum could not have evolved in a straight line, uh, but there's a lot of evidence suggesting that it evolved from the type three secretion system. So bacteria, um, like to inject molecules into other cells. Um, and they do that through this type three secretion system. And when we look at the bacterial flagellum, all the proteins that it's made of, almost all of them come from this type three secretion system. And it's just a slight modification of that system that gives you this flagellum, this thing that can kind of spin around and act as a motor. Sorry, I probably should have explained that. The bacterial flagellum is a motor on a bacteria they, they used to, to swim with. It's a little tail and it's a, it's a very complicated structure. 
and it evolved as an exaptation from the type three secretion system. Feathers on birds evolved from the conical scales of reptiles and um, our, our knowledge of this comes from studying how the feathers develop on a bird. Um, I'll have to do another talk sometime where I show all of that because that's that's a lot of fun to, to look at. Actually, I believe I have an old talk on this Stated Casually channel, uh, How Did Flight Evolve, which goes over that briefly. Flight feathers evolved from insulation feathers. So the earliest feathers were not used for flight, they were used for insulation. Bird wings are modified arms, so they have evolved from arms, and you can actually see the uh, hand bones, the finger bones, the wrist bones in a uh, in a bird's wing. The heart, you know, we have this incredible heart, very complicated structure, and when we look back through evolutionary time, mainly in this case because hearts don't fossilize well, when we look at comparative anatomy, we see that the heart appears to have evolved from muscled vessels. So in very small organisms, uh, small organisms living in the ocean where they get a lot of their, their oxygen and you know they do a lot of their uh, um, chemical exchange just through their skin, they don't really need a heart because they're such small animals surrounded by liquid living in the water. They, they don't really need a full heart and our ancient ancestors were such organisms. And as they began to get larger and more complex and they needed, uh, in order to get larger, you need to distribute uh, some sort of a blood type substance that can help exchange gases throughout the body. Uh, you had these vessels develop and then you had muscles around those vessels develop that could squeeze that liquid and kind of slosh it through the body. And as, as that system got more and more efficient, the, organism, the organisms were able to evolve larger body size and more complex body size until eventually you have the evolution of a thing like a heart. Lungs appear to have evolved from gill pouches. There's actually some debate about this. Uh, Darwin, um, Darwin suspected that lungs evolved from uh, float bladders in fish, but we actually now think that the, the float bladders that fish use for buoyancy actually evolved from early lungs. Uh, and those lungs originally evolved from just uh, kind of sacs that developed in the back of the throat allowing fish to gulp up air when there was not very much oxygen in the water. You've probably seen this if you've had a goldfish with, when you were a kid and um, you weren't changing the water frequently or you didn't have enough um, uh, oxygen in there, you'd see the fish gulping at the top and you're like, oh, whoops, it's time to uh, oxygenate the water. That, that, um, that behavior, what they're doing is they're, they're gulping up water or they're gulping up air, they're sloshing it, they're mixing it with the water and pushing that over their gills and through a, a structure very similar to that um, just a little pouch developing below the gills you can actually get uh, the evolution of really primitive lungs where the that within that pouch there's there's blood that's very close to the surface of the skin the the uh, the membranes there and that can absorb oxygen and from that you eventually get lungs to evolve and there's there, there are lots of fish that have lungs by the way there's lung fish for example <laughs> and then finally the the stinger of a bee the stinger of a bee is a mo is a modified ovipositor and the evidence for this is absolutely overwhelming an ovipositor is a, an organ that uh, insects use to lay their eggs and you know the only bees that have stingers are females. Uh, the, the worker bees in a colony are females. The queen bee has a stinger. The worker bees have a stinger. The queen bee uses hers to lay eggs. She can also use it to sting. The worker bees only use their ovipositor to sting. They, they no longer lay eggs. The stinger of a bee is a modified reproductive organ of a female insect. So pretty, pretty fascinating. Now, um, what I want to do here is answer any questions that people have so far. So if you want to 
shoot me out a question here on the uh, in the comments right now. I am now looking in the live chat. Um, Some people are asking, asking about the aquatic ape hypothesis. Is that still considered likely? Uh, it is largely rejected. Um, some people, you know, it, it's been proposed that humans, a lot of the traits that we have come because we went through an aquatic stage. And uh, yeah, for the most part, people reject that in favor of just, you know, living in the savannas. Um, Someone says, I had a question, and then I forgot it. <laughs> well, I'm going to give a couple, uh, just a minute here for questions, and then we're going to go on to um, learning about turtles that breathe through their butts. Okay. The the dogs are now sleeping. <laughs> okay. Why isn't that parrot feather thing just tool use? Well, I mean, it kind of is, but by that nature, you could say that, uh, you know, anything that um, any use of our own bodies is tool use. Um, I highly doubt that the the parrot that's now using its feathers as a as a back scratcher. I highly doubt that evolution will actually select and it select that for that, and that will be a major trait used by parrots in the future. But this is just an example of different individuals finding new uses for structures that they already have, and if that new use happens to really help you survive and reproduce, natural selection will favor it and will promote it, and it will become a thing in the future. So that is a possibility for these parrots. I mean, maybe if you have a, a major uh, parasite infestation and these parrots that start using feathers to pluck out those parasites are able to better survive and reproduce, then that could actually be something strong enough to where, you know, a new feather structure evolves that maybe a really good uh, back scratcher that grows rapidly and falls out rapidly. So there's always plenty of them around. Something like that could evolve in the birds, but that's, uh, you know, it's, it's a possibility. All right, I am going to move on to learning about turtles. So I'm gonna start sharing my screen again. All right, so this is the Fitzroy River turtle, and it does breathe through its butt. It was discovered in the 80s. Well, probably it wasn't discovered in the 80s. It was first described in the 80s. It lives in Australia. The Fitzroy River is where it's found. And a couple of interesting facts about its butt breathing abilities. It receives about 70% of its oxygen through the cloacal orifice. Um, and it can remain underwater for up to three weeks without coming up to surface and catch a, get, a, get a breath of air. So it's, it's extremely efficient. You know, being able to stay underwater for three weeks, that's pretty awesome. They don't normally do that, but they can if they have to. And water is pumped in and out, in and out of that orifice 15 to 60 times per minute. 
So when you know when you watch them in an aquarium, you can you can see that happen. And uh, when it was first discovered, you know, there's there's a uh, I'll have to link to this in the video description. There's a there's a write up about this species by John Legler and John Can that was done in the, it was published in 1980, where they give it the species its name and describe it really in depth. They have a lot of pictures of it and they they dissect them and they show their anatomy. But <laughs> one of the funniest things that I saw in that in that article I was reading it is that we first became aware of the large cloacal uh, bursi. Bursi is just like a name for sac, internal sac. The large cloacal bursi. When a female was examined in bright sunlight, the carapace transmitted enough light to illuminate the cavity and to produce a spectacular view internally for at least 100 millimeters. I just thought it was interesting that he called it a spectacular view of the inside of this turtle's cloaca. So for those that don't know, a cloaca is in reptiles and in birds, instead of having, you know, their sex organs separated from their rectums, they, they just have one slit and everything is inside of there. And that's the cloaca. They got the, you know, an everything hole is what it's sometimes referred to as. And um, how would you like to see this spectacular um, structure? Well, if, if you don't want to see, look away, because we're about to look and see what this turtle's cloaca looks like. So here we go. <laughs> that is a baby Fitzroy river turtle. And that is its, what they say, spectacular. That is the spectacular internal view of his cloaca. So, you know, exaptation. All right. Here's another picture. Uh, this is an adult that they, the one we just saw was a juvenile. This is an adult Fitzroy river turtle. They're really, really cool little animals. Here's another picture of one. They have, they have this really cool beak. I, I just like their, their, they're really cute. I'd love to have one. They're endangered, however. And this is a little diagram that I found showing kind of the internal structure of these turtles. They have these giant sacs inside their bodies and those sacs are filled with villi. And those villi are covered in blood vessels and they can actually pump water in and out of these sacs and those villi and the blood vessels on it absorb the oxygen and the water and bring that into the blood system into the circulatory system so it's 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 a cloacal gill a cloacal lung uh, and it breathes oxygenated water so really 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 cool structure and if just think about all this you need muscles to power this in order for it to work you need these sacs, where do those sacs come from? You need these uh, villi, where do those villi come from? Uh, all of these really neat structures that this turtle has that are, they're not completely unique to this turtle. Other species of turtle have, uh, can do some cloacal breathing, but it is extreme in the Fitzroy River turtle. And so this brings us to this question, how on earth did something like this evolve? Well, um, turtles already have lungs. And <clears throat> what that means is that because they already have lungs, they already have a way to get oxygen, a safe way to get oxygen. And this allows evolution to experiment with secondary ways to also receive oxygen. And this is something that's really good to point out. You know, people ask a lot of times, especially with the evolution of lungs, I've seen this question like, how did the first, how did the first uh, animal that came out onto onto land? How did the first animal breathe? Like, well, it, it actually already had lungs. Fish already evolved lungs long before the first fish came out onto land, and those fish were using those lungs to gulp up air when they were in water that was very poor in oxygen. So, if you are a fish from the ocean, in the ocean, there's usually an okay amount of oxygen. But when you come into, you know, close to the shore, and especially if you go up into little swampy areas, there's a lot of uh, 
there's a lot of bacteria and microorganisms that are using up oxygen and causing the water to be very stagnant. And so fish that uh, are finding food and resources in these oxygen deprived areas, they're gonna be going in there and it's gonna be helpful. The better they are at gulping up air, the more, the more efficient their life is gonna be in these oxygen deprived areas. And so fish had gills to begin with, which allowed them to slowly experiment with the evolution of lungs. And in this case, these turtles had lungs to begin with, which allowed them to start to, to experiment with the evolution of a new gill system. And you can imagine if you live in a river that has a lot of oxygen in the water, the longer you can stay underwater, the better off you are. If you're hunting underwater, if you're eating things underwater, if you're hiding from predators under the water, the longer you can hold your breath, the better off you are. So evolution was able to experiment with the evolution of these, this cloacal gill in this particular environment with this species. Cloacal tissue, so just the, the, the membranes inside of our bodies, the, the, the mucous membranes in our bodies are already very absorbent. So, you know, you know that the inside of our nose, for example, is a mucous membrane and the inside of our nose is very absorbent. If you, you know, people, people that use, there's all kinds of people that use drugs where they snort them. And the reason that snorting drugs works is because you have this mucous membrane inside your nose and it can absorb small molecules really well. And, and the same is true with all mucous membranes. We can absorb small molecules through those mucous membranes. There's blood vessels very close to the surface and they absorb molecules. So the cloacal tissue, you know, right inside the cloaca, it's already able to absorb oxygen in normal turtles and turtles that have not evolved any sort of a special adaptation for this. They can already kind of breathe through their cloaca. And the same is true actually with most turtles, just through their skin in general, they can absorb a little bit of oxygen, but especially through those mucous membranes on the inside of their body, they can absorb a lot of oxygen and other small molecules through that tissue. So they already had a head start there. This is, this is an example of an acceptation. You know, the, 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 the pre-absorbent tissue inside the cloaca, in this case, has adopted a new use a new function to absorb oxygen from the water. The muscles that help pump the water through the this new respiratory system in this turtle, those muscles are likely just normal muscles from the digestive system. And I should probably point out here that the actual evolution of this respiratory system in turtles has not been well studied. And I've thought for a while, you know, if I if I ever were to go and get my PhD and evolutionary biology, the Fitzroy River turtle is, is what I would study. I would love to be able to figure out all the details of how this uh, system evolved. It's a really, really neat system. And the, yeah, that would be like my dream research project because it hasn't been very well studied. We assume that these are just the muscles of the digestive system that have been repurposed to pump water back and forth through the cloaca. They're also still used in to, you know, when the animal is relieving itself, those same muscles are still used to expel, uh, you know, feces and whatnot. But um, it, it appears as though those same muscles have also been used to allow for cloacal breathing. The, the bursae, the sacs that are inside the turtle's body, again, we don't know this for sure because it hasn't been well studied, but they might be modified sperm storage organs. So turtles do not have, most turtles don't form bonds with partners. Instead, they'll mate once and the female will store sperm in her body that she gets from her sexual partner. She'll store it in there and she'll use that sometimes for years to come to fertilize eggs as she's producing eggs. And there are really complex networks of sperm storage cavities inside uh, a female turtle's body. Now, if this is the case, if these respiratory structures are modified sperm storage organs, this hasn't been studied. It'd be really curious. I'm, I'm really curious to know, 
are they still being used for that? Are they being used for that and for respiration? Because these turtles still need to, to store sperm after mating. Furthermore, uh, why is it that if they, if they really are these sperm storage organs, why are they also found in males? Uh, how has that been expressed in males? Of course, in, in humans, we also, um, males and females um, both have, you know, males have female sex traits. We have nipples, for example, which we don't use to, uh, you know, suckle children, but that's obviously what they're for. And that's what they're used for in females, but we still have them anyways. Is this a similar case where these, these births I evolved in females for respiration and the males got them too, because there's a little bit of crossover between male and female traits. Uh, these are all really interesting things to study, to look into. And then finally, the villi inside these, these sacs, could they be misplaced intestinal villi? So in our intestines, we have these kind of finger-like protrusions that help absorb nutrients. They give the inside of the intestine a lot larger surface area. And are the villi inside these, uh, these respiratory sacs in the Fitzroy River turtle, are they just misplaced intestinal villi? And we know that evolution can do this sort of thing very easily. It's called a homeotic mutation. When there's a mutation in the, the homeogenes, the, the genes that uh, control other genes, the regulatory genes, mutations in these genes can cause structures to develop inside of organs where they don't normally develop. So if you have a structure that, that evolved in the intestines, for example, that can then be expressed in other parts of the organism due to homeotic mutations. This is something that's studied in the, the science of evo-devo, evolutionary development. So we know it's very obvious that the cloacal gill is a modified cloaca. So this is definitely a form of exaptation. That's how the system has evolved. But a lot of the details on this, we don't, we don't really know. And it'd be really fascinating to study this. So anyway, that is the Fitzroy River turtle and its amazing ability to breathe through its butt. So I want to just go over and, um, answer some questions here. Again, super chats are prioritized here. Let me stop sharing my screen. All right, there, there I am. And Go see if super chats have come in. We don't have any super chats yet. <laughs> Someone says cloacas are yuck enough already. Uh, let's see. Someone says, show us how snorting drugs works. Uh, no, <laughs> we're not going to be doing that on the Stated Casually YouTube channel. That would not be keeping this PG, right? Someone asks, can we consider the whale pelvis bones to be an example of exaptation? They made it more efficient for mating. Uh, in that case, no. Um, in all mammals, the, the pelvis bones are already used for mating. Our pelvis bones are what anchor our sex organs. In whales, you know, so, so in a normal land mammal, you've got these pelvis bones, which are used to do a whole bunch of things. You know, in humans, since we, we walk upright, our pelvis bones act as a shelf to hold in our organs. 
Um, they sort of do that for animals that walk on all fours as well, but that's especially important in animals that walk upright. The pelvic bones also obviously, the major function, most obvious function is that they, they support our legs, right? That, that's where our legs are attached. And then the third big function is that they act as an attachment for our sexual organs. In whales, they've simply lost those other structure, th those other functions. So, so whales are using their, um, their, it's not an acceptation really, it's just a loss of a bunch of traits that already, that, that used to exist. Oh, we just got a super chat in from, uh, from Marilyn. She says, hi, John, I don't have a question, but I gave you that super chat just because you, okay. She's, okay, she's gonna make me blush. <laughs> um, looking for any more questions here. Thank you, Marilyn, by the way. <laughs> so it looks like people have many questions. So I, th I think we're going to wrap this up. Uh, just kind of in summary, new traits evolve through several different processes, through gradual evolution. By the way, I've got, um, you know, I showed you, I showed you the, uh, the flat-faced dog skull here. This is a normal wolf skull. And hold on, let me pull up my camera so I can see myself here. This is a normal wolf's skull uh, compared to a flat-faced dog's skull. And then here, we've got uh, a skull that's been uh, kind of angled downwards. And this mutation actually happened through a slow and gradual process and dog breeds that have, have faces that are sloped downwards. This mutation happened pretty much all at once. And so there's even within dog breeds, there's, we can actually see uh, when we go back through people's um, documentations of, of dog breeding, we can actually see different types of evolution happening. Sometimes there's the hopeful monster style of evolution where it happens all at once. Sometimes it's slow and gradual and breeders are able to work with tiny mutations and kind of accumulate those over time. So a lot of, a lot of what we know about these evolutionary processes um, comes from selectively breeding plants and animals and seeing how things work when we're the ones that are actually directing the evolution. And then we can also go back to the fossil record and see these t different types of evolution happening out there. And we can look at comparative anatomy to also try and help us figure out did this evolve really quickly all at once or did it evolve gradually? And we're now getting to the point, and we're not very good at this yet, but we're now getting to the point where we can start to look at just the genes involved in a particular trait. And that could help us figure out whether or not this particular trait evolved rapidly in a hopeful monster type scenario or slowly in a uh, very gradual step-by-step -step type manner, or if it's an acceptation. You know, it's, is it using all the genes from a different organ that we find in other animals? Was there a gene duplication and so on? Now, next week in my, I'm going to kind of continue down this pathway of talking about how new structures evolve, but I'm going to focus on the genetics behind all of this because there are some really, really fascinating experiments that have been going on uh, where we can, we've actually done in vitro evolution. So in vitro and in, in, in in the test tube, evolutionary experiments with genes that are made out of just nothing but RNA. And, you know, today I've showed a lot of how, how new functions evolve, not really from, from, from nothing, but they evolve from old functions. But next Sunday, I'm going to talk about how 
we get these really interesting genes to evolve from completely random space. So we start out with genes that are totally random, that their genetic sequence is totally random, and we give them some, um, some obstacles that they have to overcome. We let them replicate in the face of these obstacles, and they'll actually evolve very specific traits to help them overcome those obstacles. It's really neat. We've been doing these types of experiments now for 40 years, 40 years of in vitro evolution. And that's actually the name of a, of a paper that I'm going to be going over uh, in next week's talk. So um, very excited about that. So just looking up for some last minute questions here. Someone says, can I ask something off topic? Sure. Um, yeah, if you have a question, just, just shoot. If it's off topic, that's okay. I mean, if it's way off topic. Um, oh yeah, you like my, my Back to the Future t-shirt. It's, it's a good show, full of, a great science, right? <laughs> All right, we are going to wrap things up. There is another um, live show going on. Shannon Q's channel. She's going to be interviewing Jordan Culver. And for those of you who don't know, Jordan Culver is an amazing science communicator. He does science comics, and sometimes he works with me to, to do Stated Clearly animations. And she's going to be interviewing him. I don't have a link to that. Um, if anyone has the link to that, please put that in the comment section here. Um, someone wants the resources for molecular evolution. Uh, yeah, I will put that. I will put a link in the in the video description after I'm done with the uh, the live broadcast here. I'll put a link to that paper. Um, I believe there's a version of it that's not behind a paywall. So yeah, I'll I'll link you to that. It's a really good paper. It's a it's I mean it's an overview of 40 years of this in vitro molecular evolution um, experimentation. So. Okay, um, I'll put a link to Shannon's uh, video in the description here. It looks like she's getting ready for her her uh, presentation right now. So, going to wrap things up. Thank you, everyone. This was fun. It was good times. If you can give the video a like, that helps YouTube uh, rank it better. And the uh, once once this is published, because people can actually watch this video after it's after the broadcast is over, and that will help. Um, so, so long for now, stay curious, a lot of fun.